Super Mario Wonder launched in a really interesting context. On the one hand, 2D Mario has gotten stale. Yet while 2D Mario had fallen from grace over the past couple of years, the Mario franchise itself certainly has not. On the contrary, the Mario franchise is currently as popular as it arguably hasn't been in three decades. Thanks to the huge success of the Mario movie and the home run that the Switch ended up being, Mario is currently living through a massive popularity surge. So at the height of Mario's popularity, Nintendo released a game in the 2D Mario platformer genre, a genre that has lost popularity in the past decades. Super Mario Wonder. And Super Mario Wonder is pretty good. It is certainly a bunch of steps into the right direction. I really enjoyed my time with Super Mario Wonder. However, it also left me really disappointed. See, I believe Mario Wonder had the potential to become the best 2D platformer ever created, but there is something holding it back from reaching true greatness. And ironically, this something is the Super Mario Brothers movie. How's that for a plot twist? I believe the Super Mario movie had a surprisingly big impact on Super Mario Wonder. In this video, we're going to take a look at why I believe this. We're going to have a chat about the level design of Mario Wonder and how Nintendo evolved the 2D Mario formula. We will discuss the Mario movie and why I ultimately ain't too happy about it, even though I really enjoyed it. We will discuss what the opera Carmen has to do with all of this, and in the end, you will hopefully understand why I think that Mario Wonder is an excellent game that left me a bit disappointed. We have a wild flight ahead of us, but before we take off, just one more thing. Due to the nature of this video, this video is going to spoil the entire plot of Super Mario Wonder, of the Mario movie and of the opera Carmen as well. Don't worry, that's not the ending of Carmen in the background yet, that is just the ending of La Traviata. Alright, we got tons of things to discuss today, so let's get this thing going. My name is Sif, you're watching Sif Perspective, a place that hopes to give an interesting perspective on great games. This is Super Mario Wonder. The game begins with us taking control over Mario. We just arrived at the Flower Kingdom. The local monarch, Prince Florian, is giving us an inspiring speech when all of a sudden our old friend Bowser appears to ruin the party. Bowser grabs the flower that is floating above us, which transforms him into a gigantic floating castle and corrupts the surroundings. Bowser stole the Wonder Flower and the Flower Castle, and now the entire Flower Kingdom is in danger. Oh and no. Luckily, we are here to help. Together with Florian, we set out to save the kingdom. And with this, the game begins. The opening is incredibly brief and, you know, I really enjoy this. Mario games really don't need much of a setup or a story, so the faster we are jumping through stages, the better. There's just one thing that is interesting about this intro. Nintendo decided not to do the usual the princess has been kidnapped trope. I wonder if this is a general trend and if they are generally trying to move away from this going forward or if it is just to give them an excuse to include people as a playable character. Anyway, we find ourselves on a world map and head towards the very first stage, Pipe Rock Plateau. <laughs> The original Super Mario Bros. follows a very simple plot. An evil turtle called Bowser kidnapped the lovely princess of the Mushroom Kingdom. And only we are able to stop him. We start the game and immediately find ourselves in the middle of the action. To our right are a bunch of interesting things. There are a bunch of blocks. Some special blocks with a question mark on top of them, which contain a delicious mushroom. There is a Goomba and there is a pipe. Let's head back to the present. We enter the Pipe Rock Plateau and right in front of us well, would you believe it? There is a question block containing a mushroom, a bunch of brick blocks, a Goomba, and there is a pipe. Super Mario Wonder starts with the exact same setup as Super Mario Bros. did back in 1985. In my opinion, this here is the core problem of the 2D Mario series. The design of the original Super Mario Bros. was already so timelessly great that even today, almost 40 years later, every game still follows this formula. Almost four decades have passed, but the power-up system is still so brilliant that every game uses the same blueprint. Question blocks are still mysterious fun little slot machine boxes and fuss still in every game. Goompas and Koopas are still great basic enemies and they never really found anything to replace pipes with either. Super Mario Bros. on the original NES was already so incredibly ahead of its time that even today, almost four decades later, Mario games still start with pretty much the exact same setup. And that is a huge problem for the Mario series. You know, if the very first game already features basically flawless core elements, 
then how do you evolve a franchise forward? And this question is, at least in my humble onion, what sent the 2D Mario games into the creative crisis of the last decade? To keep 2D Mario relevant, Nintendo has to evolve something that started close to perfection. They needed to shake something up that began timeless. And at least as I see it, the new Super Mario games that came before Wonder never quite figured out how to solve this problem. New Super Mario Bros. U was fundamentally Mario Wii again. Mario Wii was pretty much a copy of the DS entry. And the DS entry, well, that one was basically Super Mario of the 80s again. Nintendo never found a way to evolve to the traditional 2D Mario gameplay. So why are we spending so much time waffling about this at the beginning of the video about Super Mario Wonder, one might ask? Well, because this staleness of the Mario series is, at least as I see it, the core problem that Mario Wonder had to solve. How to create a new Mario that still feels like old Mario. And, as I see it, they finally found a solution to this seemingly unsolvable problem. Actually, they found two solutions. So the obvious one first. The very first level already tells us a lot about how Nintendo approached this problem. The very first stage is a traditional Mario stage. It's 80s Mario all over again, until we find our first wonder seed. Consuming this wondrous seed suddenly transforms the stage into something different. The wonder seed causes the pipes to activate and to hectically move around. The stage is an incredibly conservative Mario stage, following the design philosophy of the 80s, until we collect the wonder seed. And then something new happens. Almost all of Super Mario Wonder's stages are structured like this. They're all conservative Mario levels until we find the wonder seed. The wonder seed then makes gates the traditional Mario gameplay. It shakes it up in one way or another. We may grow comically large, we may transform into an enemy, maybe the plants around us start to sing, maybe we change perspective, maybe we're suddenly thrown into a quiz, or maybe the enemies grow comically large. It's utter anarchy, we never know what to expect. Nintendo gives us very traditional Mario levels, following basic design principles established in the 80s. But for the second half of the stages, they take a hammer and hammer their own brilliant design philosophy into pieces. So Mario Wonder's premise is traditional Mario gameplay on the one hand and the negation of traditional Mario gameplay at the same time on the other. And at least in my humble opinion, that is a really clever and interesting way to approach the problem of Mario being kind of perfectly designed as it is, while also needing to give us something new. But that's just the first trick they used to shake up the traditional Mario design tropes that most of us became a bit oversaturated with in the past. And there is a second change in design philosophy going on. A really interesting one. To understand the second thing that Nintendo did to keep Mario fresh, we have to talk about the one other development in the 2D Mario franchise that happened the past decade. We have to talk about the elephant in the room and about the two games we wholeheartedly ignored so far. So are you ready? Well then let's do this. Here our plumber finds himself in the middle of a dangerous trap that Bowser set up. At first glance, everything seems harmless. But this is an illusion, because the floor itself is alive in this dangerous room, trying to crush our poor plumber by throwing him into the exceptionally hard ceiling. Mario's only chance to escape this death trap is to collect the five red coins that are hidden within this dangerous room, which grants him a key which he can use to... Here our plumber finds himself in a highly competitive stage. This angry wiggler is only willing to allow poor Mario to leave the stage if Mario manages to beat her in a race. If Mario isn't faster than our grumpy wiggler lady, then she angrily blocks the path forward and the Mushroom Kingdom's most agile plumber has to try it again. If he manages to beat her in this sadistic stage, Bowser hit the exit directly to Mario's left. Our poor hero in a jumper starts directly beside the exit. Poor Mario Mario, however, isn't able to exit through it. Oh no, the path is blocked by blocking red blocks. How is our Mario supposed to escape this room? Well, the answer is actually surprisingly simple. See, to Mario's right are a bunch of on-off blocks that start a terrifying race against the shell. If our plumber manages to win this difficult race, then he's able to reach the saving exit door before the evil shell. So what did we just witness? Well. 
Here's the thing, the three small Mario Maker ideas that we just took a look at all feature common motifs in Super Mario Maker. It is a common motif or, you know, level design trope in Mario Maker to entrap Mario in a creative room where he has to collect red coins to escape. It is a common motif to craft races where Mario has to beat, let's say, an angry Wiggler lady. And it is a common trope in Mario Maker to have our plumber make his way through a stage backwards while, for example, racing against a shell. You know, when Super Mario Maker released, most of the Mario community got a chance to design Mario levels for themselves for the very first time. This community, of course, did not only design Mario levels like Nintendo did since the 80s. We explored our own unique ideas. We built racing stages and music stages. We created levels where Mario is forced to kill all the enemies or where he becomes entrapped until he collects all coins and so on. The Mario community explored ideas that Nintendo hadn't really explored in a Mario series so far. And this is where we can finally close the circle. Because gentle ladies, gentle men and gentle people in general, all the level design tropes that we just took a look at in Mario Maker actually made their way into Super Mario Wonder. There are actual stages where Mario has to race against the Wiggler. There are actual stages where Mario has to chase a shell back fast enough, like this small challenge room, where we have to chase one of those wind-up Koopas back to the beginning. There are tons of stages where we become entrapped in a creative environment and have to collect five coin tokens. But there's even more. The game's music stages work very similar to how popular music levels in Super Mario Maker work. You know, the stages are side-scrollers in which we have to dodge obstacles while a song plays. Even the jump to the beat stages where the floor periodically appears and disappears are classic Mario Maker tropes that smuggled themselves into Mario Wonder. I believe that when Nintendo was trying to figure out how to modernize the stale Mario gameplay of the past, they tried two different things. On the one hand, they tried to consciously negate the old tropes of the past by using the Wonder Seeds. But on the other hand, well, I believe on the other hand, Nintendo actually turned towards Super Mario Maker to look for inspiration on how to evolve the Mario formula forward. I believe they actually looked at the stages the community built in the past. They turned to community created content for inspiration. And, you know, if I'm right with this, then, well, I love this. You know, if the Mario Maker community inspired parts of Mario Wonder's design, then the Mario Maker community kind of had a bit of an influence on how the Mario franchise as a whole evolved. In a certain way, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of each and every one of us who created and played stages in Mario Maker now baked into Mario Wonder. I think that is a really lovely thought and a really appreciative thing towards this community by Nintendo. So all of this leaves us with a question. Did they do enough? You know, is them drawing inspiration from Mario Maker tropes and them negating their own stages with Wonder Seeds enough to make 2D Mario gameplay feel fresh and new again? And at least in my adorable opinion, I'd absolutely say yes. Super Mario Wonder actually manages to do the impossible. It feels like a traditional Mario game while also feeling fresh and new. Nintendo did a brilliant job modernizing the formula of Mario. The changes they made to the level design all work wonderfully to make the game feel fresh. That's the good news. However, Nintendo did not only shake up the level design philosophy, they also made a couple of crucial systemic changes to the traditional Mario systems. And those innocently looking changes ended up having a huge impact on the overall difficulty of the game. I'd argue that Super Mario Wonder is about the same difficulty level as most other games in the new Super Mario Bros. series. And because of this, the game is much, much easier. With every Mario game, Nintendo is confronted with a question. A question as old as Mario himself. The question is, should a Mario game be easy or hard? And for decades, Nintendo has given the same answer to this question. This answer, of course, is yes. Take 3D World. Super Mario 3D World isn't a hard game to beat. And it might surprise you to hear, but I'm in favor of this. I do think that Mario games should be easy to beat, and I also have no problem with easy mode items like the super power-ups to help players that are less experienced with games to make it to the credits. And Super Mario Wonder is just like 3D World. Making it to the credits is doable for everyone, who cares? And if someone needs help, there's also the option to play as a Yoshi or as an Abbot, which is fine. The only really unnecessary problem that this creates is that anyone who wants to play as a Yoshi is now permanently immune to damage and unable to use power-ups. You know, why can't we just play as Yoshi and enable the easy mode by an option again? But that's a nitpick. So when it comes to being easy, Super Mario Wonder is just like 3D World. The game is easy enough to beat for anyone. And I think that is a 
good thing. Because in my opinion, Mario games are supposed to be a big E. E for literally everyone. Mario is gaming's poster boy. Mario is a franchise that is meant for anyone who plays video games. But let's hop back to 3D World for a second, because we haven't taken a look at the full picture so far. The thing is the following. After beating 3D World, more content opens up. As a matter of fact, Nintendo put the seemingly final stage somewhere at around the two-third mark of the game. There is an entire third of the game hidden behind the ending. Additionally, there are still tons of collectibles to find. And once we found those, there are a bunch of really, really tough challenges that finally test our mastery of the game. The game is easy to beat, but it is hard to truly complete. 100%ing Super Mario 3D World takes effort. And I think this is the best way to handle the difficulty in a Mario game. You know, when I said that Mario games should be E for everyone, I also thought of myself to be part of everyone. I think Mario games should try to cater to experienced gamers looking for a challenge the same way they should be approachable for a literally five-year-old. And putting the challenging content behind optional collectibles and into worlds that only unlock after the credits is a great way to make sure that the games don't become too easy while still making sure that they stay accessible. This approach has been the blueprint with which Nintendo tackled this problem for a while now. Odyssey adds a lot of content after the credits, 3D Land does, the new Super Mario Bros games all have a special world that only unlocks after beating the game and requires all the star coins and so on. It's been Nintendo's go-to solution to this problem for years and somehow they completely messed this up with Super Mario Wonder, if you were to ask me. So I know what at least one of you is currently thinking. What are you waffling, Steve? Super Mario Wonder works the same way as the games in the new Super Mario Bros series work. There is a more difficult special world hidden behind the credits and there are tons of optional collectibles. It's literally the same. And funnily, you're completely right, lovely disagreeing imaginary viewer. And this is exactly the problem. The Souls games are often praised for a lot of things. It is amazing just to think about how many trends those games have begun, small and huge. Their influence on the industry is so gigantic, it is honestly hard to measure. However, there is one feature of the Souls games that is rarely copied, the way they handle multiplayer. See, in most of the Souls games, players can leave other players little messages, giving us hints on secrets, warning us about looming threats, and most importantly, troll us into attacking perfectly fine walls by lying about them being hidden walls. Additionally, many of those games feature death reliving points, where we can see how other players died at specific spots, warning us about threats and giving us an idea on where to be careful. This online system is really unique. You know, it gives us a feeling as if we were slowly conquering all the challenges together with other players. It isn't a competitive form of multiplayer, but we are also not playing cooperatively with other people. It's neither cooperative nor competitive multiplayer. It is something that I'd like to call supportive multiplayer. It's an online system that allows players to support each other, while the game remains a single player experience. Multiplayer systems that just allow us to support other people playing the game are really interesting and, well, and there's something that in my opinion is criminally underexplored in gaming. Very few games, indie or AAA, really explore the possibilities of such supportive multiplayer systems. Which brings us back to the Mushroom Kingdom, because Super Mario Wonder is the Dark Souls of Mario. See, Super Mario Wonder features supportive multiplayer. They came up with a really unique online system. In Super Mario Wonder, we play the stages together with other people, but we're not able to interact with those players. We see them, but we can't interact with them. With just one exception. If another player dies, they float in the air for 5 seconds. And if this floaty player ghost manages to either touch us or a standee that we previously placed, then the player is resurrected. And I love this system. What Nintendo did here is basically transform each and every player into a walking checkpoint. This leads to so many cute interactions where a player might wait for us to make sure that we make it through a difficult section, or where we might stop for a second to help a struggling player to overcome the challenge. I love this supportive multiplayer, and I love to see that finally someone that isn't from software is exploring this idea. However, this system comes with a problem. See, if other players are able to plaster the stages with checkpoints, then this means, well, that the stages are now filled with checkpoints. This means that the online system makes the levels much easier to beat. So I know what at least one of you gentle ladies, gentlemen, and gentle people in general is currently thinking. See, if, if you think the online makes the game too easy, why don't you just turn it off 
Well, first, excellent idea, thank you. But second, look, it's not just the online system. It systematically makes the game easier. Mario finds himself in the very first stage of New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. It's a lovely place, the sun is shining, there are pesky coins lying around everywhere, and Mario seems to be doing good. After a while, he reaches the very first star coin. Bravely, he jumps towards the coin and hooray, our poor plumber reached it. Would you believe it? I'm so happy for him. Sadly, he dies directly afterwards in a horrible Goomba homicide. His death causes him to lose the star coin again. The end. Here, Mario finds himself at the beginning of the very first stage of Super Mario Wonder. Once again, our little hero in a jumper is enjoying the idyllic atmosphere. Once again, he manages to collect a star coin, or a flower coin in this game. Once again, he is happier than ever before, and once again, he dies in a tragic accident shortly afterwards. But this time, he doesn't lose the flower coin, because in Super Mario Wonder, flower coins still count as collected even if Mario died after collecting them. In the older Mario games, we always had to make it to a checkpoint or the end of the stage for the coin to count as collected. In Mario Wonder, we can die as often as we want after touching the coin once. As long as we beat the level before running out of lives, the star coin counts as collected if we touched it just once. And this change causes one of my biggest problems with the game's difficulty. I honestly don't understand why Nintendo would ever want to design the star coin system like this. This change introduces two huge problems. First, it makes collecting the collectibles a lot easier, which has huge implications on the overall difficulty of the game when we're going for 100% completion. And second, it actually makes it a dominant strategy to just murder Mario on purpose. There are dozens and dozens of star coins in the game that can simply be collected by killing our plumber once. It's even worse, even if we were to try to collect a coin legitimately, but make a mistake after touching it and die, then the coin still counts as collected, even though we never managed to beat the challenge associated with it. We can collect coins by accident this way. This innocently looking change completely changes the star coin system. It really has an impact. Take, for example, collecting the flower coins in the special world. Beating the special worlds in one sitting while collecting all three star coins is vastly more difficult than it is to collect every Every coin once and only then to beat the stage. It's kind of funny, because even though the star coins placement is about as difficult as in the previous Mario games, they are vastly easier to collect simply because we no longer have to survive collecting them. It's another systematic change that makes the game easier. But we aren't done here yet, because there's more. Take the item buffer storage. In the old New Super Mario games, Mario wasn't able to save power-ups for later use. This meant that we were always just one mistake away from losing our powers, and that three mistakes in a row always meant certain death. This is no longer the case. If we lose a power-up in Mario Wonder, we can just pop a new one if we have one stored, completely negating the consequences of our mistake, which, you know, has consequences on the overall difficulty of the game. In the old new Mario games, being powered up is something special, something precious that we can lose with a single mistake, but in Mario Wonder, running around powered up is much more common, because we can regain a power-up even if we made a mistake because of the storage system. The storage system makes the game easier, but paradoxically it makes the game easier for experienced players, while it has little impact to help struggling players. A struggling player is obviously going to tank a lot more hits, you know, if we're having trouble we are much less likely to still have a power-up whenever we reach a new power-up. Struggling players often lose their power-ups directly after acquiring them. They will rarely have a power-up stored. Seasoned players, however, but experienced Mario players are much less likely to get hit. They are very likely to have a power-up in storage when they do get damaged. This little change once again has such immense implications. At least to me, getting hit felt much less dangerous in Mario Wonder, because most of the time I had a backup power-up saved anyway. It removed a lot of tension. To put it mildly, I'm not a big fan of its design. But we still aren't done discussing all systemic changes that influence the difficulty of Mario Wonder, because there is also the new shiny badge system. The badges are a customization system System that allows us to either slightly alter Mario's moveset to give him an additional ability or to add a passive skill. They basically allow us to pick one out of many permanent power-ups for Mario. The one I used the most during my playthrough is the Boosting Spin Jump Badge, a badge that allows us to perform a second spin jump mid-air that adds a lot of in-air maneuverability to Mario. But there are a lot of other interesting badges as well. There's a grappling hook-like feature, there is a badge that transforms Mario's jump into Yoshi's air flutter, there is a badge that allows us to run faster 
faster, one that allows us to float down slower by using our head, one that turns Mario invisible altogether and a passive one that helps us to find all hidden secrets, to name just a few. And overall, I'm a huge fan of those patches. I love to be able to customize Mario a tiny bit. I love it that there are in-game options that help us find all the game's secrets and I love that some of those patches actually make the game harder, like the permanently jumping badge. The badges are amazing. However, they also make the game easier. Take my beloved boosting spin jump badge for example. This awesome little badge permanently adds a miniature version of New Super Mario Bros. Wii's propeller power-up to Mario. It drastically increases our maneuverability in air. It's great, but the game design needs to reflect the fact that I now potentially have a double jump and needs to make the challenges a bit harder as a consequence. The game design needs to reflect that we are now able to store power-ups and hand out fewer power-ups as a result of this change. The game design needs to reflect that the star coins stay collected after we die and make at least sure that there are no coin challenges where it is the best solution to kill Mario to get the coin and the game design needs to reflect that the new really cool online multiplayer introduces checkpoints everywhere and therefore has to make certain challenges more difficult. But it doesn't. The level design doesn't really reflect all the systemic changes. It's basically the same design as it was in New Super Mario Bros. U. The stages are similarly difficult. There are a similar number of checkpoints, a similar amount of power-ups, the optional coin challenges are similar, and so on. The game makes tons and tons of systemic changes that make the context in which we encounter the levels easier, yet it doesn't make anything more difficult to counter this. And because of this, Super Mario Wonder ended up being too easy for me. The only two stages that gave me any kind of trouble were the final two levels, and the only challenge in the game that I really had to focus to get down was the fireball section while wearing the spring feet badge. Everything else in the game I cleared without paying much attention. Mario games always gave me a bit of trouble when going for 100%, but Mario Wonder just never really did. You know, earlier we waffled about how I think that it is an important part of the Mario brand that Mario games are for everyone. But Mario Wonder ended up being so easy that I just wasn't able to shake off the feeling that this game wasn't really meant for Mario veterans. But I don't think that that was Nintendo's intention going in. I believe Nintendo tried to approach this difficulty problem the same way they have in the past. But at the same time, they made so many changes on the systemic side of things that they didn't notice how much of a change those changes made to the overall experience. The funny thing here is that I'm actually in favor of most of those changes. The online mode is amazing, I love the badges, the item storage could be interesting if power-ups were much more rare, and the coins persisting through death. Well, okay, that one I think is dumb. But overall, it's not those changes that I think negatively impact the game. It's that the levels did not become more difficult, while a lot of the things that were added just made them easier. Because of this, Mario Wonder sadly ended up being a bit too easy for my liking, which is a pity. But that is actually just a small problem. There is another thing in Mario Wonder that I found much more disappointing. To understand the thing I really dislike about Mario Wonder, we have to leave Nintendo's offices in Japan for a while, and we have to fly over the Pacific ocean to a lovely place called Hollywood. We have to waffle about the Super Mario Brothers movie. So let's do that. Let's discuss the Mario movie. And by the Mario movie, I mean the opera Carmen. The plot of Carmen follows a Spanish soldier that is seduced by a Roma woman, fittingly named Carmen. Carmen convinces the soldier to abandon his post and instead to live the life of a criminal together with her. But danger arises when a manipulative Carmen starts to play the soldier against another romantic interest of hers, which soon leads to conflict and in the end to catastrophe. The opera explores many different themes like love and jealousy, fate and freedom, and honor and death. It's actually one of the most popular and most performed operas of all time. So the Mario movie. My thoughts on the Mario movie are a bit complicated to explain. The thing is, I really enjoyed the Mario movie for what it is. But the fact that the Mario movie is what it is, well, that's where my problems with it arise from. But one thing after the other. So the plot begins with Bowser forcefully stealing the superstar from brave penguins guarding it. The superstar 
obviously gives Bowser the power to become invincible. Next, we hop to Brooklyn, where Mario and Luigi just launched the first commercial for their new plumbing business. While the two are extremely excited for the things to come, everyone around them is less enthusiastic. Mario's dad actually goes so far as to tell our plumber straight to the face that he thinks Mario is nuts and dragging his brother down with his foolish ambitions. After failing catastrophically at their first plumbing job because of a terrifying doggo, the two brothers find out that something is wrong with Brooklyn's sewers. They decide to investigate. Deep within Brooklyn's sewer system, they discover a pipe that leads the two to the Mushroom Kingdom. But while being transported, they become separated. Mario enters the Mushroom Kingdom close to Peach's castle. Luigi, however, well, Luigi lands in Bowser's land and promptly gets kidnapped. Mario, who wants to save his brother, asks Princess Peach for help. But Peach herself is busy coming up with a plan on how to defeat Bowser's evil minion. Now that Bowser has access to the superstar, he is surely about to attack. The only chance to save the kingdom is to convince the Kongs of the Jungle Kingdom to fight alongside of them. So Mario and Peach set out to the Jungle Kingdom, where Mario defeats Donkey Kong in a fight about the kingdom's army. While moving, the army becomes separated on the Rainbow Road because of an attack of Bowser's minions. Peach heads back to the castle. DK and Mario are eaten by an eel. Bowser arrives, trying to force our princess to marry him, but due during the ceremony, Peach suddenly pulls out a nice flower and attacks Bowser. Mario and Donkey Kong arrive just in time. Together, all of them defeat Bowser in a final showdown using his own star against him, which saves not only the Mushroom Kingdom, but also Brooklyn. And finally, makes Mario's dad proud of his own son. The end. So this is the plot of the Super Mario movie in a nutshell. Before we dig into my problem with this little movie, I really first want to say something nice about it. The plot doesn't make much sense, but you know, it's a Mario movie, who cares? The most important thing is that the movie is just silly fun during its runtime. And on that front, the movie certainly delivers. There are dozens and dozens of small and playful Mario references hidden, and a lot of them are really clever. I love the nihilistic Luma, who just prays for all of them to die soon. Mario explains to Peach that turtles in our world are mainly pets is a really nice touch. Mario telling Luigi that he can't be scared all the time, to which Luigi replied that he'd be surprised is a great joke and so on. The movie really understands the Mario universe and is able to poke fun at it in clever ways and I really enjoyed that. But that's not even what I enjoyed most about it. The thing in the movie that I enjoyed most are the scenes where the movie presents Mario gameplay in a cinematic way. There is this scene for example where DK and Mario are heading to the west. In this scene, the movie just shows us a ridiculous cinematic version of 3D world gameplay for like 15 seconds. There is this scene where Mario and Luigi head to their first shop in Brooklyn, where the camera is static for a while. That is a cinematic representation of 2D Mario gameplay. There is the scene where Mario tries to solve Peach's course, where the camera sometimes catches the action as if it were in-game. I thoroughly enjoyed those scenes. You know, the Mario games can't really explore the most cinematic way to depict Mario gameplay because as games, you know, they are focused on actual gameplay. A movie is not bound by those pesky restrictions. In my opinion, the movie is at its best when it really leans into the video game aesthetics and really explores the idea of cinematic Mario gameplay. My main hope for the sequel is that they lean much more into those aesthetics, but we're losing focus. We were talking about Carmen. In the first act of the opera, Carmen and the other woman are leaving the cigarette factory and gather on the town square. There, a group of soldiers starts to flirt with the woman. One of the soldiers asks Carmen when she'll finally love him. And this here, this here is Carmen's reply. Carmen answers him by singing an aria, the Habanera. The Habanera aria is one of the best known arias in all of opera. The lyrics are a reflection on the nature of love. She thinks that she'll love him if he doesn't love her, but to be aware of her love as it is fleeting and whatnot. The lyrics and the song play around with desire and the toxicity of love. There is a theme of the danger of desire in it. Our boy Friedrich Nietzsche, who himself was a great admirer of Carmen, wrote that he found the Habanera ironically provocative 
provocative, as it evoked the feeling of Eros, as conceived by the ancients, playfully alluring, mischievously demonical. In short, the song's a banger, and people have agreed about this for over a century. So why are we waffling about the Habanera aria in a tangent about the Mario movie in a video about Super Mario Wonder, one might ask. Well, here's where this gets fun. Early in the movie, Mario and Luigi have their first and only plumbing job in Brooklyn. An American upper-class family tasked them to fix their pipes. And this family has a terrifying secret. Francis, their doggo. Francis isn't fond of our plumbers since Luigi broke his precious bone earlier. And thus Francis attacks them, which causes quite a mess at first and catastrophe soon after. Here's the thing, you'll never guess which song starts to play as soon as the catastrophe starts to unfold. Bingo, it's the Habanera aria from the opera Carmen. Once the pipes start cracking and Mario and Luigi's first job transforms into a nightmare, they play the aria. And this is where things start to become interesting, because you know, why are they playing this specific aria here? Things mean things. If a movie includes another piece of media, in this case a piece of media with over 100 years of meaning and cultural tradition behind it, then a movie not only includes the piece of media, but it also includes all the meaning that the song in question carries. You know, when we add the habanera into our thing, then we put a reflection on the nature of love into our thing. We inject themes of desire, of danger, of seduction, and of lust into the scene where we play it. We also inject a bit of the 1850s into our thing. If we put a thing that means certain things into our thing, our thing then means that thing that that thing means as well, which kind of leaves us with a question. What do they want to say by playing the habanera while the doggo is trashing the bathroom here? Why do they play this specific song? And the answer is, of course, they play it because it sounds like an Italian opera song that sounds like a catastrophe is about to unfold. You know, it sounds fitting. And for them, that was good enough. It sounds like an Italian opera that runs while something dramatic unfolds. Mario is Italian, you know, on the surface it fits. It's just... Carmen plays in Spain, not in Italy. The opera also was written by Georges Bizet, a Frenchman. It also premiered in Paris. The lady screaming at us also isn't singing in Italian. That's French. And the song is about the nature of love. The song sounds fitting, while it is actually one of the least fitting songs that I can think of to put into this scene. In short, they chose the song only by looking for something that looks like a fit instead of actually searching for a fitting song. Here's another fun question. What is the most popular song of the 80s in 2023? You know, which one song of the 80s is the one song that is the most popular today? So there's obviously an objective way to answer this question, but one approach that is as good as any would be to take a look at which 80s song has the most clicks on YouTube. And the answer, at least as far as I can tell, is Aha's absolute banger, Take On Me, with 1.8 billion views at the time I'm waffling this into a microphone. Take On Me is a song about someone slowly stranging from their love interest, probably after a breakup and struggling to accept it, at least in my reading. Which brings us to the reason why we're waffling about Aha's Take On Me in a video about the opera Carmen. See, later in the Super Mario movie, Mario and Peach reach the jungle kingdom and enter it. You'll never guess what song they decided to play during the establishing shots of the jungle kingdom. Bingo again. They play Aha's Take On Me. They literally play a song about parting during an establishing shot, which, you know, is certainly a decision. Why would they play a song about becoming estranged during an establishing shot? Well, for a simple reason, because it is one of the, if not the, most popular song of the 80s. The 80s are popular right now, and they want to be popular. See, the Mario movie isn't a piece of art where someone is trying to express themselves in an artistic way. First and foremost, it is a product. It is a product designed to sell. A movie doesn't have a story to tell, it has a product to sell. And because of this, a lot of strange artistic choices are going on. They play a French aria about love over a bathroom being destroyed by a dog. And they play an 80s song about partying while establishing a new environment. And we're just starting to dive into some of the strange decisions of the movie here. Because things really start to become weird once we dive into the message of the film. 
Okay, so like most Hollywood movies, the Mario movie tries to convey a message. You know, if the film has something to say about what it means to be human, then it elevates the product a bit. It hides that there is no real artistic vision behind it. But this message also has to be so universally true and harmless that pretty much everyone agrees with it. Because, you know, disagreement doesn't make for a good product. So they probably were looking for an uncontroversial message that they can add into the script. And they came up with a revolutionary message, namely, you should pursue your dreams and believe in yourself. At least on paper. Because funnily enough, they managed to mess this up in one of the most fun ways I've ever seen. Let's do a serious reading of the message of the Super Mario movie. At the beginning of the movie, Mario is pursuing his dream of becoming a self-employed plumber, but no one but he himself believes in him. The fact that no one believes in him is personified by his dad. The core scene here is the one where his dad tells him literally that he believes Mario is nuts to give up his stable job and that he's dragging his brother down with him. So far so good. As one would expect, by the end of the movie, after Mario defeated Bowser and saved Brooklyn, his dad runs up to him and tells him that Mario was amazing, implying that Mario finally earned the respect of his dad. This causes Mario to finally feel seen. We even have Mario's father brag that Mario and Luigi are his boys in front of the entire city. So on the surface, the message of the movie seems to be clear. You only have to believe in your dreams and then you become anything you dream of, just like Mario. There's just a slight problem with this. They personify this development by using Mario's father out of all characters. See, they don't really tell the story of Mario pursuing his dreams and thus proving his father wrong, do they? They tell the story of Mario's father being right about Mario. The movie kind of makes the point that you're only deserving of your father's love if you achieve something extraordinary. At the beginning, Mario's father is disappointed with his child because he isn't economically successful, but by the end he's proud of Mario. But Mario's father never gets to see Mario for what Mario truly is. He never learns that his son was right about chasing his dream or that Mario had other people by his wonderful plumbing or you know anything plumbing related that would prove his father wrong. Instead the father is proud because Mario did something so special the whole city is cheering him. Mario did not really succeed in his dream. Mario isn't succeeding in becoming a self-employed plumber. He becomes sidetracked and ends up achieving something completely different. He truly had to earn his father's love. They you know they just never prove his father wrong in this regard. They also never do the Mario. I've been wrong about you, lampshading at the end. Mario's father is disappointed by Mario when he's unsuccessful and proud of Mario by the end when he is successful, which um, is an interesting take to put into a kid's movie, I'd say. Kids remember what the Mario movie taught you. In order to be deserving of your father's love, you either need to be economically successful or massively popular. Okay, so this isn't meant to be super serious critique of the movie or anything. I don't think that that is really a flaw of the movie. It's just interesting how shallow everything is once we really start to poke into it. You know, how can this happen? And the answer is, at least as I see it, the same answer as to how they ended up using a song about parting in an establishing shot or a freaking habanera in a let the dog loose scene. They never really thought about those things in detail. They were going for a checklist of things to include in a movie to make it the best possible product. Not movie product. So just to be clear here, I don't think that it is unethical or bad or anything to create a movie as a product first. It's fine to create a Mario movie as a product. The result was a product that I actually thoroughly enjoyed. I really don't want to come around as being cynical or anything. It's completely fine for the movie not to have a higher artistic vision. It's a Mario movie. It's supposed to be silly but fun and silly and fun it is. The reason we're digging into this is because it's fun and because it is actually relevant for Mario Wonder. But one more thing before we return to our flower cake. Kingdom. So the Mario movie was likely produced with maximal marketability in mind. Which brings us to another trick that Hollywood often uses to increase the marketability of their movies. At one point in the movie, Luigi is separated from Mario. He's somewhere in Bowser's room. It's scary there and the toy around with Luigi's mansion imagery, it's fun, it's a good scene. And then Luigi encounters a dry bone that chases him. The dry bone chases Luigi, Luigi runs into a tree, slings back at the dry bone and defeats it. So everyone who knows a bit about Mario games, which is everyone, knows that the dry bone will get up in a second again. We know that Luigi is still in danger, but Luigi doesn't know it yet. That's an interesting setting, you know? 
income, that's one way to build tension in movies. But they do not decide to build tension here. Instead, the scene continues like the following. Luigi gets up, celebrates his victory, and then says, Yes! You just got luigi And then the dry bone gets up. That celebratory moment here feels wrong while watching, at least to me. You know, depictions of a character who is in danger but doesn't know it yet are tense. But depictions of a character who wrongfully believes they are successful, even though we know that they are not, are, well, a bit uncomfortable to watch, aren't they? Which begs a question. Why do they play this scene out in this weird way? It would be obvious to have Luigi take a breather here, believing that he is safe, while we know that he is still in danger. Why not go down the the obvious route. And I believe the answer is because they wanted a shot of Luigi in the movie where he says you just got haluigi because there is a decent chance that this will become a meme. Later in the movie, Peach saves Toad and Toad says a line that equally hurts the pacing of that scene. Toad says, that's how you princess. In the same scene, there is a blue Cooper that transforms into a blue shell before chasing Mario. This one also has to spell out what's going on. You can't escape me, blue shell. Once again, I believe they spell this out in the hopes that it will become a meme. Then there is the worst scene of the movie, the two toad guards that don't allow Mario to see Princess Peach. Those guards are written super weird and super unlogically to somehow get them to say that Mario's princess is in another castle. Here they once again spell out the reference, mainly, at least in my reading, in the hopes of creating a meme. You know, memes are surprisingly powerful marketing tools. It's imagery of a movie that is being shared for free by folks online. Memes are free marketing, and so they try to create certain scenes with the main goal of creating a meme. So why is any of this relevant to our discussion of Mario Wonder, one might ask. Well, let's get back to the scene, where Luigi encounters the dry bone. What they do here is they consciously worsen the pacing of the movie in order to include a memeable moment that helps with marketability. Let's call something like this waluigi If something was waluigi then it took a hit to its artistic vision in order to increase marketability. They certainly waluigi the Mario movie. And that's fine, it ended up being a fun movie and a huge success. They certainly did a great job here. However, at least as I see it, the Mario movie isn't the only thing that got waluigi because in my reading, they also traded in artistic value to increase the marketability of Super Mario Wonder. And that one, I take personally. The whole time, there has been an elephant in the room with us. It's probably time to address it. Super Mario Wonder has a bunch of really strange and really obvious problems that we glanced over so far. So first, the bosses. The Bowser Jr. boss fights all feel a bit like a step down compared to what they did in the new Super Mario Bros. series so far. The old new Mario games all either featured a unique boss or a unique coupling at the end of the worlds. Wonder does not. Even weirder, the Bowser Jr fights are all a copy of each other. They just slightly shake up the formula. But even worse, the Bowser Jr. fights are a dated trope. They suffer from the problem that we discussed at the beginning of the video. We have just seen bosses like this too often. This boss fight blueprint is stale. The same way the level design needed a refresher, the boss formula needed one as well. But while Nintendo put in a lot of care to evolve the level design, the boss fights are, if anything, a step backwards. But it gets even weirder because some worlds have no boss at the end at all. The climax to the third world is missing entirely. Not only the boss fight, there's literally no level at the end of the world. Once we reach the final stage, we're simply given the Royal Wonder Seed without overcoming any struggle. But not only the climax is missing from world 3, most worlds have a secret exit hidden, somewhere that unlocks a bunch of additional stages before leading to the special world and unlocking a level there. World 3, however, does not. In this world, we reach reached a special stage by entering the room where we got handed out the royal seat for a second time. It's just this room. Entering it once grants us the final MacGuffin of the world, entering it a second time unlocks the special world. And at least I found this so unintuitive that I wasn't able to figure out that I was supposed to enter this room for a second time. I actually had to look up how to unlock the special world level for world 3. But it's not just world 3. The fifth world has a similarly unintuitive way to unlock its special world. Here we also have to make it through the final level a second time. The final level of World 5 
5 is the minor rescuing level, but this stage just isn't really a level either. There's no challenge in it. We just follow a linear path, bare of any obstacles, and then we get the royal seed. I found this to be extremely anticlimactic in my first time through. If we make it through this non-stage a second time, the special world unlocks. So out of Mario Wonder's 8 worlds, only 5 feature a boss fight. 4 of those 5 boss fights are Bowser Jr. rematches, and only 1 boss fight is a really cinematic battle, the final boss fight. Add to this that the endings of the airship stages are really disappointing as well. Airship levels are a Mario trope that often ended with a boss fight in the past. But not so in Wonder. In Wonder we have to platform on a conveyor belt until we hit a button. That's it. It's all a bit anticlimactic. And to make matters worse, they repeat this underwhelming challenge at the end of every single airship. Then there is the fact that the game only features 8 worlds. New Super Mario Bros. U, the Mario game that came before, featured 9 worlds in total. So did Mario Wii before it. 9 worlds is the amount of worlds that, at least I, came to expect from a Mario game. Which is doubly interesting, because there is a huge empty world-shaped hole on the world map, where the 9th world would have perfectly fitted. Then there are the wonder effects that the flowers cause. So how to put this? Some wonder effects are more wonderful than others. Some effects completely twist how we play. They suddenly throw us into a game show situation. They completely reinterpret the environment, change our moveset and whatnot. And others, well, some wonder effects just feel a bit underwhelming. Especially the collect all five flower medals, flower effects. They repeat that one a bit too often for my liking. Especially since it is probably the most boring flower effect. Then there are a bunch of mini challenge stages that just take longer to load into and out of than it takes to beat them. Those often feel a bit underwhelming as well. Some of those just don't have the same level of polish that the main stages got. But it's also the main stages. Some of them are just weirdly short, take the level bounce 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 in a special world. That one is just a bunch of screens long and over in less than a minute, especially for a special level world that's a bit of a letdown. Alright, so there are repeated flower effects. Stages that feel as if they were cobbled together at the very last minute. Repeated boss fights in a Mario game with an unusually low amount of boss fights to begin with. Two worlds missing the secret exits. The same worlds missing the final level. Rushed endings to the airship stages. A low amount of worlds to begin with. Missing boss fights. Some strangely short stages that lack polish and so on. Do you notice a pattern when looking at all of those things from a distance? It might just be me, but to me, all those problems are problems that typically appear when a game has to be rushed out to meet a deadline. My, that looks like they had to cut content last minute, antenna is bleeping wildly. You know, certain parts of the game are so fantastic and wonderful, like in a literal meaning of the word. They are full of wonder and surprises. And then the airship stages end in a boring and repetitive way. They have these wonderful crafted music stages, filled with twists and little jokes, and then there are short challenge rooms, like zip go round or the music room levels, that are barely developed at all. They have wonder effects like the gigantic fish chasing us, a Bowser statue coming to life and trying to crush us, or us being able to do ultra mega uber jumps. And then they have wonder effects that are repeated ad nauseum, like collecting five flower medals. They have secret exits that unlock several additional new stages with cool and unique wonder effects and secrets themselves and whatnot. And then they have worlds that don't even have a real hidden entrance to the secret world and no final level. The game features the most creative credits that I've ever seen in a game, yet it barely has any boss fight worth mentioning but the final one. You know, it appears to me that some areas of the game just had a ton of effort put into them, while other areas seem to be rushed out towards the end of development. And this gentle ladies, gentlemen and gentle people in general leads us to a really interesting question. And back to the Mario movie. You see, Nintendo in its current situation doesn't need to rush out games. The last time Nintendo released games that blatantly needed more time in the oven was during the GameCube days. But the situation that Nintendo finds themselves in today is in no way comparable to the GameCube days. During the GameCube days, Nintendo was losing the console war against the PlayStation 2. They were desperately trying to somehow stay afloat. In 2023, however, Nintendo is at the top of gaming. They are in an incredibly comfortable position. It certainly doesn't threaten them economically economically if they were to delay a game. Because of this they actually have allowed games recently to take as long as they needed or need 
take Tears of the Kingdom or the new Metroid game. So Nintendo is in a comfortable economic situation and they have allowed games recently to be delayed until they were happy with them. I'm speculating here obviously, but if my reading that Mario Wonder had to cut content close to release is correct, well then that leaves us with a question. Why? Why didn't they just delay Mario Wonder for say six months and release the game with, you know, actual boss fights as an example? And as I interpret the situation, the answer is because of the success of the Mario movie. They want to release as many Mario branded games as fast as possible to keep the hype train rolling that the movie started. They want Mario Wonder to be on the market right before Christmas in the year of the Mario movie. Here's the thing about the Mario movie that we haven't really chatted about so far. The Mario movie was the second highest grossing movie of 2023, only slightly trailing behind Barbie and beating Oppenheimer by a wide margin. It grossed almost 1.4 billion dollars. Just to put things into perspective, the most accurate sales number for Mario Wonder that we currently have is 4.3 million. So for the sake of argument, let's say Mario Wonder goes on to do 10 million lifetime sales at $60 each. If this were the case, then Mario Wonder would gross 600 million US dollars, less than half of what the movie grossed. Just to be clear here, it doesn't make much sense to compare those numbers, it's just to visualize how big of a deal the movie is. The insane success of the movie changed the Mario franchise. Mario is no longer just a video game series. Mario is now a multimedia franchise. And multimedia franchises consist of many wheels that all power each other. The Mario games sell the tickets for the next movie, and the movie sells the next game, and so on. The franchise is about to transform into a huge machine built out of many wheels that all turn the next one. A turning marketing machinery where the Mario movie is used to sell Super Mario Wonder and Wonder is used to sell the Super Mario RPG and the RPG remake is used to sell the Paper Mario remake and that one is used to sell a new Lego set or plushies or Super Mario toys that come with each Happy Meal at McDonald's. Each little wheel powers the next one. If a franchise is conceptualized like this then it's simply no longer possible to delay a game because if we were to remove one single wheel, we'd stop the entire machine. I believe this is the reason why Mario Wonder is missing some content that should be there, like creative bosses and final stages in each world, and why some content that is there feels rushed, like the ending sections of the airships. Because even if they wanted, it's not possible to delay the game, not even for a month, because a month later, the Mario RPG already releases, and in spring the Thousand Year Door remake hits the shelves, and by March, they're probably already already busy selling us the made-up HBO Mario adaptation or a new theme park. There is a certain franchisification going on with the Mario brand for a while now. And don't get me wrong, this has me excited. That's not a black and white thing. If this is what it took to finally get a Thousand Year Door remake, honestly then I'm all for it. But it also has me a bit worried, because it means that Mario games have to be planned years in advance, with very little room for error. Which, you know, has the potential to cause problems along the road. In 2014, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze released, and I personally believe Tropical Freeze is the best traditional 2D platformer ever made. It features really unique ideas, like stages that slowly start to burn while we make our way through them, or a whole world that is an ice factory. It features creative ideas, like levels where we play as silhouettes. It features some of the coolest bosses in the history of 2D games. It has a difficulty that I find thoroughly engaging, tons of collectibles, lots of content, optional late game challenges, and most importantly, it's just a polished game with a clear vision from start to finish. When I take a look at Super Mario Wonder, I do see so much potential that reminds me of Tropical Freeze. I see so much potential for insane boss fights using the Wonder Seeds. I see so much potential for unique gameplay, like when the game shows us the stage only in silhouettes and makes us grow huge. I see so much potential when platforming through the final two stages and I finally encounter a pleasant level of difficulty. I see so much potential when jumping through stages that are inspired by Super Mario Maker tropes, or when the game transforms into a game show, or when the Piranha plants start to sing, or when I discover a hidden flagpole and suddenly unlock three more stages. There is so much potential in the game. But unlike Tropical Freeze, Mario Wonder never really unleashes its full potential. 40 years ago, Mario's rise to popularity began with a very simple game. It began with a game called Donkey Kong. The arcade game Donkey Kong 
conquered the world by storm. And it did so because Donkey Kong was an exceptionally good game for its time. There is a certain irony to the fact that today Mario is incredibly popular, but at least in my opinion, lost the crown of 2D platforming to Donkey Kong along the way. I wonder if the reason actually is Mario's popularity. Tropical Freeze was just a game. There were no other expectations tied to it. It was just supposed to be the best 2D platformer they were able to craft. I believe Mario Wonder had the potential to become an even better game, but expectations outside of the game meant that it never really had a chance to become as fully fledged out as Tropical Freeze. I believe that Nintendo, while we cheat its potential away, they traded in a lot of the artistic potential that Mario Wonder had to maximize the marketability of the game. As I see it, Mario Wonder ended up being a very good Mario game, but it did not end up being the best version of the game that it could have been. Hooray! So here we have it. Mario Wonder has disappointing boss fights and it's arguably Hollywood's fault. So before we wrap this up, just two more things. First, a gigantic and mushroom kingdom spanning thank you to all my wonderful patrons whose names are currently scrolling by. There was a bit of a drama surrounding my previous video about Outer Wilds and the wonderful people whose names are currently scrolling by really kept me afloat last month. So a huge thanks for that. If you want to read up some YouTube drama, I did an open write-up over on Patreon. There's a link to it in the description. Second, I quickly wanted to waffle about something that didn't fit into the script otherwise. So first, I really think it's a huge missed opportunity that the game doesn't officially track if we have beaten a stage with one of the three special badges. You know, if there was just a small indicator somewhere that tracked if we have beaten the stage while, say, permanently jumping or while invisible, then that would really incentivize us to go back to all the levels and to beat them with those badges drastically increasing replayability. That's actually such a small addition that I still hope that they might add it in a patch. Second, the shop system doesn't really work because we always have enough money to buy whatever we want once we reach the shop anyway. Currencies only feel valuable when we can buy something of value with them. I wasn't even paying attention during my playthrough and always had enough flower bits to buy whatever I wanted immediately. I believe that if they had added a bunch of cool badges to the shops that were expensive to buy, then it would have gone a long way to make flower bits feel much more worthwhile. Hooray. And with this, it's time for us to wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching this little video. I hope you got at least some entertainment and value out of it. If you liked it, liking it back would be a gentle ladies move. If you're interested in more long form content, discussing games, subscribing might be a good idea. And if you truly love the video and want to ensure that content like this can survive on YouTube, then there's also the option to support the channel via Patreon. All right, thanks for watching. Until next time, lots of hugs.